And the words that are used for it gets a ship confused will not be understood as the spoken. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Mick Napier with our usual Sunday afternoon broadcast um, with voices interviewing people whose voices we think have something significant, very significant, to contribute to the struggle for Palestinian freedom and our efforts to develop effective solidarity with that struggle. We've had a host of uh, prestigious speakers over the last few months, and I'm delighted today to introduce Mazen Komsia. Uh, Mazen is many things. He's very much involved with uh, institutions in Palestine, concerned with sustainability and ecology. I hope you'll tell us more about that. But he's also, among other works, the author of the book you can see behind me, um, Popular Resistance in Palestine, A History of Hope, and empowerment. Welcome, Mazen Kumsia. Thank you, Mick. Thank you for having me on your show. It's a real pleasure, and I would exhaust my Arabic if I say to you, La shukr ala wajib, and no thanks for a duty. Um, and at a time when Prime Minister Johnson and Mr. Netanyahu are hand in glove, it seems to me it's indeed a duty for people in Britain to support uh, the victims of that pair. Mazen, um, some years ago, we had another prestigious visitor here who, um, who spoke to meetings across Scotland, uh, Archbishop Atalahana, another prominent Christian um, and icon of Palestinian resistance. While he was here, Mazen, he said to a huge demonstration, um, there has never been a day in Palestine of... Uh, fighting between the Christian and the Muslim communities there. When we contrast that with the horror of Syria and Iraq and so on, could you comment on that, Mazen? Uh, yes, Palestine historically, for thousands of years, has been multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, and even multilingual society. Uh, all people lived here in, in peace and harmony. Uh, uh, perhaps one of the most peaceful countries on earth. We did not have uh, as frequent conflicts as, let's say, uh, other countries in Africa or Europe or Asia. Uh, certainly Europe, as a percentage of its history, uh, had much more conflict than we did. For example, if you take away the present conflict, you'd have to go back to the time of the Crusaders to find another conflict. Uh, and these are usually things that come to us from outside, not from inside. Uh, people of various religions, etc., as the picture behind you also illustrates, uh, have always gotten together, basically, and have always worked together in friendship, in harmony. Uh, we had no such thing as, uh, you know, sec uh, sectorial differences or religious differences. People went to the same schools, uh, same workplaces, and, uh, and continued this. And this has to do with, the, with our location also, being at an intersection of continents between Africa and Eurasia, uh, a place of uh, commerce and a place of transitions. And even uh, the earliest humans migrated out of Africa through Palestine. So we have to realize that we are all indebted to this geographic area for being the cradle of civilization. That's part of the Fertile Crescent. That's where we first, as humans, domesticated plants and animals. So I think you know one can understand that this geography, geology, and history led to this remarkable peace and harmony and coexistence of people in this part of the world. There are, no, um, there are no Jewish uh, clerics in the photograph behind me, as far as I can see. Um, but we're just past the anniversary of the assassination of uh, Jacob Dahan, who was murdered by the Haganah as the spokesperson for the native Palestinian Jews uh, while campaigning against the Balfour Declaration, I think 1922. Mm -hmm. um, so does that... Does that history given compared to the blood-soaked soil of Europe this 
history you're describing of the of the of the Middle East of Palestine, does that also include the Jewish communities there? Yes, uh, before Zionism, there were Jewish uh, native Palestinians. They spoke Arabic. They are Arab Jews. They are Palestinian Jews, just like there's Palestinian Christians, like my family, and Palestinian Baha'i, and Muslim, and Druze, and others. They were an integral part of the community. Uh, we in Palestine do not look at these communities as minorities or anything like that. We look at them as integral parts of our society, different religions. So uh, we Palestinians, for example, Palestinian Christians, before 1948, comprised 15% of the population. And the Jewish Palestinians, uh, before Zionism in the late 19th century, comprised about 3 or 4% of the population. Those Jews who are native rejected the idea of Zionism, just like all the other religious communities in Palestine rejected Zionism. And the reason we rejected Zionism has nothing to do with the fact that the uh, adherents of this uh, ideology claimed themselves to be Jewish. It has something to do with uh, changing a character, as I said, of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious society to make it into a Jewish state of Israel. Obviously, all the native people, including the Jews of Palestine, rejected this uh, notion. Uh, we have to remember that Zionism is not a movement that originated here. It originated in Europe mm. in the 19th century, and, uh, and it really is not connected to the reality here of what is happening on the ground. Imagine you said that Palis uh, Chris Christians in Palestine used to be about one in six, 15% uh, or so of the population. It's now much less than that. So presumably, we are told in the West, that's due to fanatical Muslims and Christians feeling they have to flee from those Muslims. Would you like to comment on that narrative? Uh, yes, actually, you know, it's remarkable people don't read history. In uh, 1948, there was an ethnic cleansing of Palestine, where 500 plus Palestinian villages and towns were depopulated by uh, the Zionist forces who established the so-called Jewish state of Israel. And when they ethnically cleansed those 500 villages and towns, uh, the population that was made refugees you look at the percentage among those refugees who are Christian, and you find that it's also 15% at the time. So indeed, ethnic cleansing did not discriminate whether you were Jewish or Christian or Baha'i or Druze or whatever, I mean, or Muslim or, Jew or Christian or Baha'i. All of them were ethnically cleansed if they don't happen to be Jewish Zionists. Now, uh, of course, after the creation of most Palestinians became refugees. Now, the Palestinians who remained in Palestine is a small minority um, at the time, um, and the Jewish state of Israel was declared and started pressuring people to leave. Now, Palestinian Christians are more connected than the Muslim brothers and sisters, so they were more able to leave the country when they were pressured than their fellow Muslims. There's also a factor... Sorry, but you mean they had networks of family and so on in Canada? Yeah, because they are connected yes, to Western churches also and to other people, and they were, uh, you know, spoke other languages. For example, the Greek Orthodox uh, spoke Greek. Uh, the Catholic uh, Christians in Palestine spoke, uh, uh, you know, Italian or some other language, French primarily. And was this partly, sorry to interrupt you, was this, because it's really important the way this, this drivel is, this, is, is propagated in the West. Yeah. Was this partly a class issue that the middle class, the Christians were more middle class or was it something else? Yeah, the Christians were certainly more economically stable and prosperous than our fellow Muslim uh, uh, brothers and sisters. But the other thing is, I think, you know, um, as any sociologist tell you, the economic situation of a family determines its children, number of children. The poorer the families are, 
they more their yeah. children. So the Muslims in Palestine who are much more um, suffering basically had more children and were getting much more uh, productivity. So their numbers increased far more than the remaining Christians. Now, I had the pleasure, the only time I ever went to Gaza was you'll remember the time when Palestinians blew a big hole in the wall between Gaza and Egypt and uh, people were pouring out. I went there for a week and I was able to meet um, somebody in the Gaza diocese, the, the priest there, Father Musalam. Um, I paraphrased, but he said he was getting fed up with Christian fundamentalists, evangelicals from the USA, trying to get horror stories about uh, Christians being oppressed by the Muslims. Um, you must have some personal uh, rubbing up against that, Mazen, yeah? Well, I lived in the United States for many years, and I faced many uh, Christian fundamentalists. Usually they belong to these uh, ideas of dispensationalism. Uh, uh, they call themselves Christian Zionists. Uh, I think that's an oxymoron. You cannot be a Christian and a Zionist. Uh, they must be reading another Bible than the one I know. Uh, as a Palestinian Christian, we read what Jesus had taught us, and we were the first Christians, and obviously our uh, local native Palestinian Christians' take on things is very different than uh, somebody who lives in Texas uh, who believes that the end of the times is coming and that uh, we have to bring quote-unquote, bring Jews back to, uh, to the land here so that we can speed up the arrival of the Messiah, you know, and such mythological uh, uh, idiocy that, that is totally unrelated to the religion of Christianity, in my humble opinion, as preached by Jesus. So, yeah, I rubbed shoulders against them, and I, <laughs> I challenged them, and uh, many Palestinian Christian clergy like... Um, Father Atallah Hannan behind you and others have challenged these uh, people. And we challenge them on theological ground. We can also challenge them on logic and other, you know, history grounds. Um, they don't have facts behind what they say. They have uh, basically Zionist uh, propaganda behind them. And we can, uh, we can educate uh, fellow Christians about what's going on. Mazen, Father Manuel Musalam there at the, on the right-hand side, if, if it's not a mirror image of viewing. But he said something um, when he was approached uh, about being oppressed by Muslims. He said, I'm a believer. I believe in Jesus Christ. And so I'm a, but they said, culturally, I'm a Muslim. What, do you, what did he mean by that? How does that make sense to you? And how would you explain that to, to Westerners looking in on Palestine? Well, Islam came to our part of the world, to the western part of the Fertile Crescent upon the spread of Islam in the 6th century AD. And so we're talking about 1400 years, uh, almost 1500 years of, uh, of Muslims living in uh, amongst us and having spread the religion among our people. and. Um, and this is something that we are very proud of because this is a civilization, a culture, basically. It's not a, an issue of religion. So in many ways, you know, they, obviously we speak the same language. We use the same terminology for God. Allah, for example, we say Allah is, you know, Allah Akbar. God is great. You know, these, these are common terminologies, common culture common history uh, for 1500 years uh, as different people, different religions in our part of the world. So that is why I consider also Islam to be part of my culture. Uh, Islam not, not per se as a religion, but as a culture, as a, as a way of looking at the world, as a as a day-to-day -day living together with our fellow Muslims. So when we have Christmas, uh, fellow Muslims celebrate with us because they also believe in Jesus. Uh, uh, and when they have Ramadan, for example, I remember as a child, I look forward to Ramadan 
because that's where I go and have certain sweets that are available only in Ramadan. Yeah. And so this has become part of our culture and traditions to have this diversity, which I must say diversity is our strength. You know, diversity is not a weakness. As a biologist, I can tell you, you know, a nature, an ecosystem out there, if it's dominated by one species, it is not a healthy ecosystem. The same for human societies. Uh, a human society dominated by one religion or one culture or one language or white skin, for example, like Nazi Germany tried to do with Aryan, German, whatever, uh, that, that is not a sustainable uh, system. And we believe in diversity. And we believe diversity gives us that richness, that beauty of the life. Uh, you know, I happen to like blue color, but would I want my garden to all be blue flowers? It does not make sense, you know. Uh, so diversity is beauty, diversity is uh, strength, uh, whether it's in uh, ecosystems outside of the humanity or, or human systems. So you don't have to be a Palestinian, but presumably as a Palestinian, no. you would uh, object to... Uh, Politi social monoculture, can I say, yeah. a Christian state like Franco's, God forbid, or a Muslim state like Saudi Arabia, or a Jewish state that seems to be in the process of being constructed in large areas of Palestine. Could you comment yeah. on that? We are against uh, any idea of uh, dominance, uh, uh, of taking a country that's... Uh, you know, polycultural, polyreligious, and making it into a monoculture, uh, something that's one thing or another, whether it's Jewish state, Muslim state, white state, as South Africa tried to do with apartheid, or, uh, you know, or any other state, or in this case, a Jewish state, as in the Zionists are trying to do in Palestine. And they are failing at it, and I think the, the failure is... Uh, is natural in such uh, situations where you try to destroy something that's very natural and make it uh, something that is not. In any anti-colonial struggle, Mazen, there's an attempt by the colonial power to divide and rule, um, to try to weaken the numbers opposing them. There, have there been attempts over the decades by the Zionists to co-opt Christians, to give them marginal privileges over Muslims? We see how some of the Druze have substantially been incorporated to, to give loyalty at the moment, so, so far, to the Zionist state. But what have been the Zionist efforts to privilege Christians in the past and what happened? Actually, the Zionists have failed at that too. They have tried, as you pointed out, to divide and conquer a la what the British have done, for example, when they ruled in various parts of the world. Uh, but, uh, but in the case of the Zionists, their attempts have, have been feeble and have uh, met with the strong resistance and without any success. And even if I take the example of the Druze that you gave, Israel made a deal with some Druze leader to force the Druze to serve in the Israeli army. There's many Druze who refuse to serve in the Israeli army, and yeah. they end up uh, in jail. And most Druze young do not look at Israel as their state, because it's a Jewish state. And the reason for that also, I think it's uh, unlike other colonial powers who have been successful at the policy of divide and rule, uh, Zionism has failed because from the beginning it, divided, it uh, defined itself as a Jewish movement, not as a colonial movement, strictly speaking, regardless of religion, uh, just people coming from Europe, for example, whether they were Protestant or Catholic. A Zionist movement said to itself and to the world that we are a Jewish movement and we represent Jews only. And so cannot obviously represent Druze or Christians or Muslims or anybody else. Um, and as an exclusivist, ethnocentric, chauvinistic, Ashkenazi, if you want, state, they discriminate by nature against anybody else. They even discriminate against Ethiopian Jews 
as you heard, there's massive demonstrations ongoing till today of Ethiopian Jews within the state of Israel who are demanding equality and they are not getting it because it, the state was constructed as an eth ethnocentric Ashkenazi, basically white supremacist Jewish state, not as a state of its people. The Kairos Declaration, um, I believe, has the support of virtually every, or maybe every Christian sect in Palestine. Um, can you explain that to people, Mazen? And, and specific, I'm specific. I'm not a believer, but I'm specifically interested in the Kairos support and call and being an integral part of the Palestinian call for BDS. Right. Can and you explain to people what it is? I was involved actually in the Kairos document, the initiation of the Kairos document 2008. And the Kairos document is a document modeled along the call by Christians in South Africa of various denominations to fellow churches around the world to join them in liberating South Africa from the tyranny of apartheid, from the racist regime in South Africa at the time. We modeled it along the, uh, along the same guidelines and, uh, and so forth. Uh, Just to be clear, Mazen, you were, involved, you were involved from the beginning in the Kairos drafting and designing, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Fantastic, I didn't know uh, that. Please continue, sorry. So it is, it is a remarkable document, as you pointed out. Every single Palestinian Christian denomination has signed on to this. Uh, and was was part of this. This is remarkable for those who, uh, in your audience who don't know how we Christians sometimes <laughs> don't get along with each other, Greek Orthodox, Catholics, yes. Lutherans, Protestants, etc. Yes. Uh, that all these factions agreed to one document is in itself a remarkable success. Mm. But the document is so clear, it follows the message of Jesus and asks people, to get engaged, be the salt of the earth, engage in boycott, divestment, sanctions, a la what we did with South Africa under apartheid. Uh, so I find it a very, very powerful document, and, and your audience should check it out. KairosPalestine.ps, I believe is the website, but they can also Google Kairos Palestine. That's K-A-I-R-O-S Palestine. I'll add the link at the end so that people can access that, yeah. So, yeah, so I think it's, a, it's really optimistic. It's really a wonderful document that uh, ecumenical, that brings people together, that encourages people to act in a nonviolent way to, uh, to pressure the state of Israel to end its racist policies and, and uh, repeal all its racist laws. And there are over 65 laws that discriminate against non-Jews in the Jewish state of Israel and, uh, and hundreds more that are military orders in the West Bank and Gaza that discriminate against us Palestinians. A, a, a hard question, Mazen. Are you, dis you, you say you're optimistic. I, I remain optimistic, definitely. But are you disappointed by the response from Christian churches to the appeal from their Palestinian brethren? I see, for example, we know the Church of Scotland a few years ago published a document um, very, very critical of Christian Zionism. The Bible can't be used to dispossess people. But they won't come out and support the Palestinian call for BDS. What do well, you think? Uh, I mean, one... I am always hopeful. I am 100% hopeful. Optimism is another issue. We can be optimistic. Uh, as one philosopher once said, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, and optimism of the will is the hope that we have. Now, to go to your question, what, what about what's going on among the Christian communities in the world? Well, there is a minority, which is a Christian Zionist, Christian fundamentalist, dispensationist Zionist uh, Christians uh, who are very minority within the Christian community. I have no problem with those people. They are deluded Christians. I consider them kind of a, 
uh, mentally sick, if you want, because they are not Christian, in my humble opinion. When you uh, support wars, for example, and you say, go bomb Iraq or bomb refugee camps, that's not Christianity. They are a minority. What, what disturbs me more, actually, or what, what gets me thinking more, is about certain mainstream churches uh, and mainstream Christians who are reluctant to take positions and advocate for human rights uh, because they feel it may Im impact their comfort level. And this bothers me more than the Christian, so-called Christian Zionists, uh, because when you are, let's say, a Catholic or a Protestant, whatever, and you say, well, I don't want to criticize Israel because I would be called anti-Semitic or something like that. This to me is very disturbing because, you know, certainly Jesus, our model as Christians, uh, was not averse to taking risks. And he himself was crucified for speaking out the truth, obviously, and telling those uh, those uh, in charge of the temple what, what he thought about them. I come with a sword, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so, so I think, you know, if we want to model our life after our religion, if we really believe in this and not, not just use it hypocritically, then we ought to take strong stances and not be afraid. So apathy to me is actually more dangerous than uh, supporting Zionism. And I, I would urge all Christians around the world to shed their apathy. You can't, as Howard Zinn, an American Jewish author, actually wrote a book by that title, says you cannot be neutral on a moving train. You know, you, you cannot be neutral in such situations of injustice. Martin Luther King said the same thing. In situations of injustice, if you're not on the side of the oppressed people, you are on the side of the oppressor because you pay taxes, because you're part of a system, etc. So I think it's really important, incumbent on us human beings, not only to believe certain ways, but to act in certain ways. And and this is the part that I um, I feel disappointed about certain segments of the Christian population. But this is changing, and I see more and more. Christians willing to take a stand and speak up for human rights. We hope so. Um, although this is a very secular country, Mazen, um, the recent opinion study of attitude shows church attendance continuing to fall. Um, and I wonder if it's uh, to do with the church's very generally rotten record of collusion in imperial power and colonization and violence towards native peoples. I don't know if you could tolerate a joke, but you know, the two, uh, the two Brits in front of a firing squad and uh, one says to the other, I'm going to ask for a, a blindfold, to which his friend says, don't cause any trouble. <laughs> and you know, that timidity, that cowardice, that standing on the sideline and trying to not see what's going on. It's got a long record. It's got a long history in Britain. You know, the, the, the ministers and the priests blessing the troops going off to war um, and not really blessing their victims very much. Am I too cynical? No, I think, you know, if we look at the history of humanity as a whole, one can look at it as a cup half full or a cup half empty. Uh, we have had much uh, significant atrocities in the past from slavery to colonialism, North America, South America alone, 150 million natives uh, died as a result of the European invasion. Uh, you know, there was the Belgians, uh, King Leopold in the Congo, 11 million people were killed. So one can think about these things and get overwhelmed by these atrocities that happened to us in the past. Or one can focus on the positive things. The book that, I'm, that you mentioned, my book, Popular Resistance in Palestine, is subtitled The History of Hope and Empowerment. Because I do want to emphasize that despite all these uh, horrors of our past, there has always been people 
good meaning, you know, well meaning people who acted in the best uh, traditions of uh, altruism and humanity and taking care of each other. And the book actually, I wrote it uh, after I read the book by Howard Zinn also called The People's History of the United States, which speaks Wonderful about book. Wonderful. Yeah, not, not in terms of the history as told by the history books that are government approved about, you know, the Thanksgiving, the whites sitting with the Native Americans and having, uh, you know, corn and turkey, uh, but the reality and how the common people resisted and how the common people achieved things. And you find that even in the U.S., which is the biggest, as Martin Luther King said, the biggest purveyor of violence in the world, uh, even in the U.S., you find uh, you know that people acting together manage to do remarkable things. Mm -hmm. For example, getting civil rights, getting women's right to vote uh, only in the 1920s, by the way, and getting uh, it's getting a 40-hour work week, getting unionized, getting you know the the positive things that we think are important. Uh, happened uh, ending U.S. support for apartheid South Africa. All of these things happened how? They didn't happen because of some politician getting inspiration from God or deciding to change their views uh, because of a good conscience or something. No. Mazen, Mazen, come on, are you really a Christian? I'm hearing you quoting Gramsci, Howard Zinn. I think you're a dangerous radical. Um, we don't hear Christians talking like <laughs> we don't hear Christians talking like that I'll here you, in Britain. Yeah, I'll tell you a story about that. One time, you know, the Israelis questioned me a lot, and on the way back from uh, from one trip abroad, they were questioning me for a long time, and I was getting tired and frustrated. So the good cup and the bad cup, you know, is, is in front of me, and the bad cup says, "So you are a Christian." And I said, no, I'm also a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, and an atheist. Uh, <laughs> and he said, are you mocking me? I said, no, I believe there's truth in all these things. So you take what you think is right from these different uh, cultures and traditions. So no, I am not a Christian in the classic sense. Um, of uh, some Christians. I believe I'm Christian in the sense of uh, the inclusive Christianity that I think, you know, Jesus, who was a good teacher, in my humble opinion, uh, taught us to be respectful and to be inclusive of everything and everybody and every ideas. And I think if Jesus and Marx and Muhammad and Moses were together in one room, they would be the best of friends. Well, it's kind of strange, all these white supremacists uh, who call themselves followers of uh, somebody born in the Middle East, probably with a brown skin, uh, trying to expel as many brown skin people as possible from the state. Yeah. yeah. Mazen, um, popular resistance in Palestine. What, what, what would be the main theses, the main points you would want to convey in that book and your other books? Well, the reason I wrote this book is because uh, I wanted, I write books because I want to understand myself. I wanted to understand where we come from as Palestinians, what our heritage is, and I wanted to emphasize the positive things. I didn't want to uh, write a history based on what leaders, whether it's Yasser Arafat or Rabin or Ben Gurion or, or the Western leaders and many collusionist Arab leaders like the royal family of Saud have done. I wanted to write about what the common people think and do and how that makes a difference. And, uh, and in so I wanted to basically encourage first myself and then of course later I put it in writing so that other people can be encouraged. So I did the research primarily to to feel encouraged, hopeful, and empowered myself. That's why the subtitle, as I said, Hope and Empowerment. There are always people who are willing to resist and to organize on behalf of their fellow, fellow nationals, fellow na uh, citizens. Um, Mazen, uh, I had a final question for you. Yeah, I mean, I certainly don't 
underestimate Americans. You mentioned that long litany of uh, heroic struggles. But I'm a bit older than you, I think, and I was involved in the struggle against the war in Vietnam. And Americans in their millions, some of them died, but they, uh, they defeated American militarism. And we have to hope that that can happen again. Um, what kind of voice should, you're a Christian, you're coming here to speak to general uh, um, you know, meetings. Um, nobody's going to check people's teeth when they come in to see if they're Christian or not. They're there to hear your message. But what kind of voice should we be adopting towards Scottish or British or other Christians, mainstream Christians? They're not dyed in the wool dispensationalist uh, Zionists. But, you know, they really need to get moving. Uh, they really need to respond to the call from uh, their brothers and sisters in Palestine. We need a voice to, to address them, which isn't platitudinous, which isn't patronizing, which isn't, you know, we have to say, look, come on, you've got to do something. What advice would you give those of us who don't go to church, but we need to speak to our religious uh, fellow citizens who, have a, who operate from a Christian ethic, um, just as we may operate from a different ethic for a common conclusion? Give us advice on how to talk to Christians here. I think you talk to all human beings in the same way. I think we are all in this together. We share this one beautiful blue planet and we face existential uh, threats together. It's not an issue of Palestine, uh, you know, as a separate struggle. It's part of the struggle for humanity, to reclaim our humanity, to stay human. Uh, as a species, Homo sapiens now faces potential extinction, either by global climate change or by nuclear war. You know, the U.S. alone has 85,000 nuclear weapons. Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons, and other countries have them. And these could destroy our civilization. And so we face this threat. And I think the audience is smart enough to understand that they face these threats of a global catastrophe, basically. And they understand that the people who are promoting these global catastrophes and people who don't want to talk about climate change and want to divide and conquer, so to speak, so that they do it for what? They do it for money, for greed. So I think this is logical, and most people grasp it immediately. I don't have to, to lecture them or anything about that. It is common sense. Uh, all we have to do is discuss, basically, how we should move as a people, as a human species together, not as Palestinians or as uh, Scottish people or as whatever, you know, it's as human beings, how do we move so that we have a sustainable planet? And our enemy is the same. Your enemy, my enemy is the same. It's, it's people like Donald Trump and, uh, and Netanyahu and Modi in India. And most recently, I'm sorry to say also here, we have people like Boris Johnson who are just interested in money and lying and cheating their way, and they don't care about the planet or its people, or even their own people in their own country who are suffering because of these policies. So I think it's time for us to get our hands together more and work together more in a global uprising, not just in a uprising at the local level like the yellow vests in uh, France, but on a global level, we have to get our act together. The, the Great March of Return is a very special, unique example of popular resistance against a, a massively armed, cruel um, power. In a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be interviewing um, Nurit Pele Delhanan, who's written about the intense racism of Israeli school books. And she tries to answer the question, how can the soldiers behave with such cruelty towards Palestinians? And she finds part of the answer in the school books. How, given the tremendous violence, the snipers killing Palestinians, medics, disabled people, double amputees, journalists, children, is nonviolent popular resistance appropriate against an enemy such as that? 
is, or Gandhi's, is Gandhi's view. And Gandhi said it was better to fight than to submit completely. Um, but is, is not, I mean, I think it is, but what would your argument be for advocating nonviolent popular resistance in Palestine against such a, an incredibly brutal uh, power? Yeah, uh, yeah. the quote that you mentioned, Gandhi, what he said, uh, the quote was something like, if I had the choice between not doing anything and doing armed or violent resistance, I would do violent resistance yeah. or armed resistance. Uh, but he thought, of course, that popular resistance, uh, which he didn't use the word nonviolent resistance, he refused to use that terminology, uh, he used words like Ahimsa and Satyagraha, which are more positive, uh, and that's why I also use popular resistance. Uh, but to your question, um, resistance to colonialism and resistance to oppression is done in hundreds of ways, variety of ways. And it's not, uh, that's also another reason why I do not use armed versus non-armed or violent versus non-violent because there's not it's not this duality you know there are literally hundreds of forms of resistance and people can place themselves in the area they're most comfortable uh, doing in terms of the resistance and uh, i place myself in certain forms of resistance that i do most of them are popular resistance uh, in nature that mobilizes enough people to do things, even children and mothers and so forth can participate in them. But it's a, it's a bell-shaped curve of resistance and the armed resistance is only a small part at one end of the uh, curve and it merges with the other forms and the lines cannot be drawn in them. For example, is throwing a stone at a tank uh, considered violent or non-violent resistance is doing economic sabotage of a of a an oppressive uh, system, or putting, for example, sugar in a tank of a of a bulldozer or something. Is that uh, violent or non-violent? You know that different rational people can disagree on this, but my point is that there's a bell-shaped curve of resistance. It's all legitimate, by the way per international law. International law says people who are oppressed have a right to resist by any method they choose. And they, of course, is not a collective decision. Different people choose different methods. Mm. So I and you have, are comfortable with certain forms and other people are comfortable with other forms. So we choose different forms of resistance. Uh, my, my thoughts is that it is not a matter you, you never find uh, colonial, anti-colonial struggles in, in which one form of resistance is used. There's always all these forms of resistance. In South Africa, there were hundreds of forms. Some uh, believed in armed resistance, like Nelson Mandela. Others believed in non-armed, non-violent resistance, like Desmond Tutu. Uh, this is all legitimate. Um, presence under colonial occupation. And each of us have to choose the methods they are most comfortable with uh, on a uh, conscious level, religious background or whatever we have for our background. Mazen, Mazen Kumsia, thank you very much for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, your meetings in Scotland and across the UK I hope will be very successful. Finally, would you like to comment on the present uh, smears of many, many British people who are accused by the media, by the pro-Israel lobby, by the right wing of the Labour Party of being driven by Jew hatred when we oppose the snipers on the Gaza periphery? Um, I mean, I was involved in a campaign against the war in Vietnam. It was kind of madness. We were told that Vietnam had invaded Vietnam and America had to stop it, even if it meant killing millions. So this irrationality is not unique, but the form of it is unique. How would you urge people to respond, Mazen, and, and make some concluding remarks, um, if you would? 
Yeah, I mean, this is uh, remarkable. They have used similar tactics in apartheid in South Africa, for example. They used to say if you speak out against apartheid, means that you are anti-white, or if you are white in South Africa, you are a self-hating white. This is ridiculous, of course. It is, uh, and, and, here and you were a communist. And you were yeah, a communist. You were a communist, terrorist, whatever. Terrorist sympathizer. Of course, they will call your name. It's just, you know, for me, it's, of course, illogical, and we should speak out clearly and honestly, uh, regardless of how they call us. But I, I just wonder, how is it uh, logical to call somebody an anti-Semite for uh, wanting human rights for native people uh, in Palestine, uh, Christians, Muslims, and others who are uh, fighting for basic human rights to live on their own land. How is that being anti-Semitic? Uh, it to me is totally illogical and totally distorted. And, you know, I might add, <clears throat> not unexpected. I mean, to be attacked for doing what is right is not unexpected. And and what we should do is, again, you know, go by, going back to what I said earlier, if people are, even if they're not Christian, even if you're atheist, uh, what do you believe in terms of what you should be doing and your role in life? And if you get attacked for it, what does it mean? Maybe it actually means you're doing something right. You know, of course, if you're doing something wrong, you should stop doing it. But, but if you believe in what you're doing, uh, let them call you whatever name they want to call you. First they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they attack you, yes. and then you might win. So, uh, so we're getting to stage three out of four now. Mazin, when we win, we'll, be, we'll dance together. Look, it's a real pleasure. Thanks again for doing it. I'll see you in Scotland. Thank you. And, uh, thanks again. Thanks. Take care. Bye, Mazin. For those of you who are still listening, I want to draw your attention. To, I forgot to mention this to Mazin, but a couple of years ago, he's a biologist. He's very much involved in uh, sustainability, ecology issues, and so on. But a couple of years ago, the redoubtable Eirik Scandret from Scottish PSC and also Scottish Friends of the Earth got together with uh, his colleagues and comrades from South Africa and uh, Palestine and representatives of the three Friends of the Earth groups uh, did a study in Palestine, really mainly the West Bank actually, um, and reported back on the crimes of the Israeli occupation against the environment and the Palestinian people living in that area. So this is a publication of Friends of the Earth International. It was later adopted uh, as policy by Friends of the Earth International it's available on their website, but we thought it was so good that Scottish PSC published, uh, sorry, printed uh, a thousand copies of this Friends of the Earth publication. And if you're involved in Extinction Generation or Friends of the Earth or uh, you know, climate justice issues, please get in touch and we will make sure that you get a copy or two. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, this is an interesting week on... Uh, in weeks to come, we have uh, Mahmoud Zouare. How could I forget him? Uh, Mahmoud Zouare is one of the leaders of the popular resistance committees in the West Bank who faced down uh, the brutal, the rabble of soldiery who enforce a brutal apartheid uh, against the Palestinian people, and still they resist. I'll be interviewing uh, Mahmoud in a week's time um, at 4 p.m. on Sunday, the usual time. And then a week after that, I'll be interviewing Nurit Peled Elhanan, professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, who has made a seminal study of the racism of Israeli school textbooks and she connects the content of those textbooks with uh, a racist settler colonial regime and the brutality of the soldiers who repress people like Mazin and others struggling for their freedom. 
This is Mick Napier once again on behalf of Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign for the regular Sunday afternoon interview. Thank you for listening. Please like the page. Please share the video as widely as you can. It really helps us. But more importantly, it really helps to see the Palestinians in three dimensions for what they are, a people struggling for their freedom in all their variety. Thanks again and goodbye.